Well, hello and welcome to this week's edition of Unbelievable with, no, hang on, it's the Doubts Aloud podcast. <laughs> I'm your special guest, Justin <laughs> Riley, and the usual hosts apparently are here, Andrew, Francis and Ed. Thanks for having me on, guys. That's well, Thank you for joining that's us. That's great. Yes. So yes. today we've got just not just Justin Brearley, we've got the Justin Brearley here <laughs> on the Doubts Aloud podcast. I'm going to have to say that. <laughs> yes. There are there are other Justin Brearleys around, I hear. In fact, there's one that frequently gets mistaken for me on Twitter and then sends oh. people over to me when they tweet him. But uh, yeah, <laughs> well, that's there nice are a few of us. And I still tend to say Brearley. It's Brearley, isn't it? So it is. It like, is but so speaking, many people still say it, don't they? I, I answer to them all, to be honest. Right, I, fair I, enough. I frequently get called Jay. Jason as well, actually. People oh, seem to sometimes mistake really? Justin for Jason. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, we've we've all been on your show. You um, have, haven't you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think it's I like don't a know. reunion. It is like a reunion. I've been on three <laughs> times, I believe. Yes, I have. And Ed, you've beaten that, have you not? I th- well, at least How three. I think it might be been? certainly no from one four, maybe three. Three or three or four times, I, I would imagine. I've, I've been yeah. on twice. Oh, I've been right. on twice. Yes, yeah, so, so, yeah. so collectively. Was, once was with Richard Morgan, wasn't it, Francis? It was, yes, that was and, the first and what, time. And, and then the there was the time, time about mean? miracles. Oh, oh yes. of course, yes, yes, yes. That's right, with Ken Fish. That's yes, right. that yes. was him, yes. yes. I was on with Dee Warren in 2009, Dee Dee Warren, I think it was, mm. on Praetorism. And then I was on with Greg Boyd in 2014. And then I was on with... Um, uh, Karushi, um, the, the, the late Nabil Karushi, the late yeah. Nabil Karushi. What a yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah that was. And really I think sad. we kind of had you at various points in your journey. You in did. Way, you yeah. had me as as in the yeah. fold as as a liberal um, mm. at the point of. Um, that um, praetorism discussion mm. and then sort of I was sort of evolving you sort of saw it before your yes. eyes <laughs> yes somehow we failed to <laughs> yes, turn, turn, right. that, turn that right. journey around <laughs> yeah I, I remember when yeah. you interviewed me you said something like you know now a lot of people have doubts and they have severe doubts and they they end up here and there but 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 dropping off the edge Andrew <laughs> I remember that was the phrase you used <laughs> come on now dropping yeah, off the edge go. what's going on you know. There you go. There you go. No, but so, well, it's, I mean, and and I, I just want to say thank you as well to all of you because you guys very much form a core of um, a lot of what we do on the Facebook group as well, and you've you've all had a role in helping to moderate that group. And I kind of handed it over to a group of both Christian and non-Christian, you know, folk, um, because it was it. I I I, I couldn't um, moderate everything that was going on, and I just have to say, you guys do a, a great job on that. So thank you very much for for all that you do on that. Oh, oh thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes. Yes, to the idea. group. Yeah, indeed. So Ed, yeah. So if you want to okay this episode, well, we it's it's just fantastic to have you with us, Justin, and um, I particularly me was really keen to discuss a couple of chapters from your book um one of which i found really quite inspirational and um it has really affected the way i kind of think about the world uh, when it comes to morality and human value and that kind of thing um so obviously i thought that was the sort of the, the highlight of the, of the book chapter three on human value mm. um and uh, so it'd be great to sort of kick off yeah. with we're talking about that. Yeah, great. I mean, do you want me to sort of sketch out my my perspective in that chapter? Um, mm. uh, yes, <laughs> yes, I think that'll I, be, I quickly, that'll be good. I quickly read it before, <laughs> before the, <laughs> uh, the getting on the podcast just to remind myself what I actually wrote. But um, I mean, I've I've always found the moral argument one of the most compelling arguments for God, personally. Um, and as I say in, in the chapter of this book, um, which for anyone listening, by the way, who doesn't know what book we're talking about, it's unbelievable why after 10 years of talking with atheists, I'm still a Christian. I can't imagine there are any listeners who don't know the title of the book, though, um, because, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, some of you are involved in even writing a response book to it. But um, the, <laughs> the, 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 the point I make in that chapter, um, and it's one of a sort of a series of arguments that I kind of collectively believe kind of point towards god as the best explanation for things um is simply that um it, it, it we we intuitively feel that some things are really right or wrong um and when it comes to human value specifically uh you know we codify that idea in things like the universal declaration of human rights we believe that just by dint of being human you have a particular set of rights the particular way you should be treated particular set of values uh, that should be ascribed to you and and i meet many atheists who you know um 
are enthusiastic about that idea. In fact, I mean, athe- m- many, most of the atheists I meet are advocates for social justice of one kind or another, you know, and, and, you know, will be the first to be marching when it comes to racism or any other issue, you know, around justice. Um, but I've always found it really difficult myself to understand where an atheist, and with, by that I mean really as someone who subscribes to naturalism, um, and we could talk about that, um, how, how they ground that belief. Now, this won't be new to, to any of you. Um, I'm sure you're all very familiar with this argument in one form or another. But, um, but the interesting thing is, for those who, who you know, have not gone into the minutiae of Christian apologetics and the atheist Christian dialogues that exist, um, a lot of the, the, no, the non-Christians and atheists I meet simply haven't thought about this fact, of, about, well, why, why do I believe that humans have this intrinsic value and dignity? Um, and where does that value reside? Um, and I've, I can't see where it does reside on a purely naturalistic worldview, where ultimately everything is reducible to uh, energy and matter in motion. Um, I think the idea that humans are given that value by the fact they're created by a god who places their own image in them makes better sense of that um, intuitive idea that we have this this value. Now, of course, you can simply say, well, we don't have such a objective value. Um, and that that is, of you know, an obvious way of sort of simply countering it. And if if you go that direction, if you say, no, all values are absolutely subjective, that's fine. My argument does not stand um, if that's your view. The problem is that I think it's very hard to to live that view, to live that that idea. Uh, and most of the time when I get into dialogues with atheists, um, they, they usually end up wanting to smuggle in some sort of objectiveness to, to morality and to human value along the way, it turns out. So I often find that their commitment to this subjectivism isn't as, um, you know, uh, I, I don't find it very convincing in the end. Um, so if you do believe in some fashion that there is an objective realm of moral values and duties and that humans have some intrinsic value and dignity that um, is not sort of simply handed to them by the opinions of others or somehow is just an illusion foisted on us by an evolutionary process. If you believe that there is some kind of objectiveness to it, then, then I think the best explanation for that is, is to be found in God. Um, And I don't, find an explanation for it in in an atheistic worldview is is where i go with it so that's in a in a nutshell kind of what i try to put across in the chapter can i um try and explain uh, my view which yes. is that morality is objective uh-huh. but i don't believe there's i wouldn't put it in terms of there's a moral objective realm mm-hmm. um and Where I would say the objectivity comes from is that to be objective, something doesn't have to be completely independent of human thought. It just has to be independent of the personal opinion of the speaker. So if just as an individual, I might say something like, oh, I like um, vanilla ice cream. That's just a personal expression of my tastes. But if I start talking about, uh, shall we say, that smoking is bad for you, mm. well, you could say that what's good or bad about being healthy or, or being more healthy or less healthy, that's, that's a kind of subjective thing. But it's not a personal expression of taste. I don't think anybody would say, well, it's just your personal taste to be healthy. That's something we all agree on. And when you have that element of agreement, that is what can bring in the objectivity when you have established rules for arguing about something. I mean, we wouldn't bother to argue about um, morals, would we, if we didn't feel that there was some objective measure that we could use that would say this is right and this is wrong. And I'd, I'd like to try and compare it with other things that are also dependent on humans, but which we also treat as objective. So, For instance, um, London is the capital of the United Kingdom. Well, that's something that is only true because humans exist. If humans didn't exist, there'd be no London and no United Kingdom. And I don't just mean there'd be no London in the sense there'd be 
no buildings, there'd, there'd be no concept of London. You need humans to have the concepts. And I think that morality is just another concept that humans have formed. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think that's a, a great way of putting a kind of an alternative perspective on it, um, Francis. I, I suppose, I mean, just, just to tease out some of the examples you gave there. So, yes, we can say smoking is bad for you. Well, what do we mean by that? There's an objective. The, the objective part of that for me is if you smoke, you will be more likely to develop lung cancer, let's say. I think mm. we, can, we can all agree that's an objectively true statement, mm-hmm. yep. you know. Um, now, of course, <laughs> there is a value judgment then about whether that is good or bad for someone, you know. Mm. Um, you know, th- whether it's bad for you um, if you are, I don't know, two days away from your going to the death chair, you know, to the electric chair, mm. you know, you might say, well, huh, doesn't really matter at that point. Mm. Um the and 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 in a sense there's there, there so so there's a there is a sort of subjectivity to to that whole question of you know ultimately though the value we place on the fact that it will be more likely to to, to cause our, our us to develop lung cancer and so on now in a sense i i'd say um something like london um it's a great example um of yes uh, sort of an objective there's an objective nature to the thing we all agree on if we all agree on a term then we can say that that's objectively true um but i'd i i find morality sort of doesn't doesn't quite you know fit that kind of a a category because i don't know i mean we could equally all collectively decide to rename london you know brussels let's say mm. And if we all did that, then we'd simply have changed the definition, you know, to a different thing. Or we could all collectively decide that London now is only, you know, 10 square miles in the centre or something. You know, so so we could all, you know, for whatever reason, come to just a different definition and then agree that. And that would then kind of be our definition of, of London. But um, it strikes me that you can't do that with morality. It's not the kind of thing where you can just collectively agree to understand it in different ways now we may inevitably you know what we believe about morality as a society well may change over time and not denying that but as you said yourself i think um the fact we even argue about morality suggests there's a, there's oh sorry my microphone just fell over uh try that again um the fact we can actually disagree about morality suggests that there's a kind of a standard to which we think you know it needs to be progressing there's there's a kind of an end game um in mind and for me that that suggests there is a sort of an objectivity to what we're talking about it's not simply that we can just redefine it if we wanted to you know if we all just collectively agreed on something it feels to me like we're we're all in search of uh something that actually exists outside of ourselves and when we do come across something that suddenly you know if we decide oh it turns out racism and you know the way we treated people and made them slaves 250 years ago was really wrong we discovered something true about the universe not just that we happen to all collectively changed our mind on a subject we discovered something true about humans um so that that for me is the difference it's it doesn't feel like something you can just re redefine mm. in the way that you could and you could give it a kind of title of objectively true now that we've all agreed on it sort of thing uh, i feel like if we all agreed that racism was fine it would still not make it fine if that makes sense um no it it, it does make sense i suppose what i'd say about that is that um morality is a system and you can't just pick one part out of the system and it, it's it, being a system, it all interlinks. So mm. it's not like a series of completely standalone rules. So when you have the concept of morality, everything has to have somewhere, there has to be something in common. And I suppose what I say with all these things having common is 
avoiding harm and promoting welfare. I mean, that's a very rough rule of thumb. Mm. And mm. of course, there will be exceptions. But I, that's what I'd say that if you have, if you couldn't take racism and say, oh, racism's fine and fit it into the rest of the system without it obviously being like a square peg in a round hole. You can't be saying, oh, you mustn't steal from each other. Um, You mustn't uh, lie to each other. You mustn't cheat on your partner. Um, But it's fine to be racist. That would just... I don't know. I mean, I I feel like (laughs) cultures have been able to do that in the past. They've been able to, in a sense, have a form of morality where they have been able to say, you know, you go back to ancient Rome... Um, you know, that they had a moral code um, mm. and it included some people being worth far less than others. And that was that they, you know, they got on, they, you know, they got quite a lot done. Um, mm. it, it, it wasn't as though society crumbled. In fact, to some extent, many people would have, you know, in that day and age, Romans would have said, we could not do what we do without having slaves and people who are second class citizens mm. and everything else. So, so there's a sense in which um, it doesn't strike me that, that you can't run a society with, without having inequality and, you know, baked in to the kind of the moral code uh, there. It's just that we recognise now that the way we understand it is better and therefore mm. seems to be. I, I, I would certainly do. agree that uh, the move, there's been a move in uh, our understanding of morality where we've widened the borders. But... Um, uh, Ed, is there anything you want to say? Because I don't want to yeah. monopolise the conversation. Yes, yeah. Justin, have you um, come across some people using a two-tier kind of approach to this? Because that's where I go from. Tell, tell me what it is and I might recognise it, Ed. Yes. Um, so you start with something which is subjective. Uh, mm-hmm. So in my case, uh, I think human value is a great place to start. Mm-hmm. And I got onto it through reading your book. Um, and... Uh, well can i just say why i think that's so brilliant because of mm. what it means is i do moral things because i value people yeah it's, it's not some kind of obligation or sense of shame if i step out of line of the tribe or or something like that it's just mm. no I, I value people and that makes me do what i do so i make it, it helps me feel good about myself when i'm being moral mm. rather than just sort of doing doing what i have to do um and and that provides that gives energy and say yes this is great but i would agree with you that it's subjective um so that would be the foundation the subjective uh valuing of humans or maybe uh from what france was talking about uh the subjective decision that what we want is to benefit people uh have human flourishing i think something mm. that's been used so um so that that's the sort of uh subjective step then once you've got that, you've got a goal, mm-hmm. then you can do objective things. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when murder is wrong or, or torturing babies is wrong or that, that kind of thing uh, is ab- objectively true. Well, yes, it is. Once you have the goal of yeah. human flourishing yeah. or human value yeah. or whatever. Well, it's like that with anything. I mean, if you decide that the point of life is to get rich as quickly as you can and stuff everyone else, then there are objectively better ways of doing that, you know? Yes, exactly. Um, if it's, if the goal of life is to, you know, increase your uh, golf handicap, you know, whatever to, to whatever, you know, there are, you know, there are lots yes. of things we could simply put as the goal and then say, yes. of course there are objectively good and bad ways to do that yes. just as we can, you know, yeah. and, and often the, the example that's given, you know, that the, the uh, illustration for morality is like chess i've heard you know said yes well, as long exactly. as we agree on the moves uh, you know and the outcome you know the game of the game then there are objectively better and worse ways of of doing chess and, and that's like morality yeah and i'm like well yeah but you've made a massive assumption what the point of the game is to start with um uh, it's and what the moves are you know that are allowed within the game that that's that's a lot of metaphysical stuff that you're bringing to the to the equation if you like yes and, well and, francis and, was bringing one thing yeah uh, and 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 you know and if it's you say i don't think I one value, is enough yeah but you say i value people yes exactly that's, yeah. that's fine that's your kind of that's your sam harris like kind of flourishing of sentient beings is the kind of most basic thing but 
Yes, it's almost more underlying that. What, yeah. Why should we bother about flourishing if you, you right? Know, well, because it's because you, we value because we value people. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But I guess I would just say then. But and as we you all said, do. I, yeah. I, but I think you've already said that is your that's a subjective preference of Ed Atkinson, right? That's, um. Well, that's, it's uh, uh, yes, but what I want to say next is that all value is subjective. Um. Right. So uh, you can't have value without a valuer. And um, so a, a great artwork is, is, is gr- greatly valued by people. But mm-hmm. if, sudden, if nobody, it, suddenly we all wiped out and the artwork is still sitting there in an empty museum. Yeah. It, it, it's lost all its value. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because the value is not intrinsic, it's extrinsic for everything. Well, it is. might be for art. I wouldn't say it is for everything. I mean, that's the difference. It's like if there were, you know, one human left on the planet and no one around to value that human, therefore, would that human lose all their value? Um, I don't well, think and only the value that not, the human not gave to themselves. To yeah. <laughs> well, not to themselves, but in a sense, I, I can if I enter that thought experiment and I, I think about, you know, would I rather they lived in a world where they were happy and got on or they were experiencing some terrible thing, you know, I would, you know, I, I, I kind of have a, a sense of the value of that person. I don't, don't think it's sort of just because they, they value themselves. So I, I don't know. I, I just don't, I don't feel like the art thing. I mean, I, I totally get that. You know, there are lots of things. Well, I'm, in, yes, I'm trying that, to say what value means. Value. Yes, yes. So, so when God values us, yeah, which is how you root value, it's still subjective. He he's decided, or that's his his style, that's his goodness. That it comes from him. That he he chooses to or, or does value humans. Well, yes, I suppose. I mean, it, it can't be something he can just stuff inside us. This sort of value, it, it has to be valued by somebody. Well, I think yes, I suppose. I suppose that's right. I mean, it's a bit like um, I don't know the yeah. I, so, so w- what you're asking, I suppose, Ed, is is why why does the fact that God creates us and puts His image in us in the Christian view confer value on us? Is it because God is like a, you know, just a really big version of, of us subjectively valuing each other? Um, I'm not sure it's quite that. It, I think it's it's something to do with the God being the foundation of morality. So it sounds a little bit like what you're you're kind of asking. So it's, it's you know touching on what's sometimes called the euthyphro dilemma, which is you know does God simply value it and therefore or say what's right and wrong and therefore if he wanted you know good could be wrong and wrong could be right and so on. And so it's in a sense, just as subjective. And I would, I would simply say, I don't, that's not the way I understand God um, as some sort of arbitrary dispenser of value. Um, but that, that God, you know, at the center of this Christian what view that I take is that God is love, you know, that God mm. is defy. you know, God is constituted by what is right and what is wrong there that it's kind of, intrinsic to god it's like white you can't simply say well today white's going to be black it's like if it's white it's white there's no sort of it, it's it's kind of part of its definitional nature if that makes sense so 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 that's why i suppose i'm, tr- I'm trying to get my head around this myself but that's why i think there's this value isn't sort of arbitrary or or, or subjective when it comes to god it's it's kind of baked into the nature of things if that makes yeah. sense well if it's the nature of his love then that's wonderful but it, it would still be subjective from that point of view subjective by but then if you're talking about god it's very hard to talk about it being subjective if god is the ground of all reality in what sense is god in any way subjective if if it's sort of it could only be subjective if there were another being that god was sort of in competition with yeah. if that makes sense it's well it's, it's more like, that we're in competition with rocks or something that that he's loving us in a way he doesn't love rocks sure yeah okay yes i mean god god obviously yes i can agree with that that god god does 
value some things more than others in 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 that kind of way um yeah. but that doesn't make it subjective in my view that 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 just it's more that it's more the idea that because god is conferring value in the way that you or i might confer value on a piece of art say um that that somehow makes god's value within us subjective i just don't see that that's true because when when you're talking about god you're talking about something that is by definition the ground of everything and the ground of morality it's it is the objective reference point for everything else so i i i just don't see that you can say that god is subjective in in the valuing in that sense but yeah. Um, yeah. i'd like to um take this into a deeper level <laughs> and um because uh, i have a quite a different take on, on the moral argument probably than even Ed and Francis, in the sense that um, with two distinct <laughs> two distinctions, one is that I tend to, uh, when it gets to the philosophical side of moral arguments and everything else, I leave that to Ed and Francis. I tend to get more into Christianity stuff and Bible stuff, and but I, I find that the moral argument has a massive when it's linked to Christianity has a massive mm-hmm. elephant in the room problem because it was actually probably an internal moral argument um, instinctive within me that was appalled when you linked it to Christianity. And, and I saw the moral argument actually being a problem for Christianity then for it. And that's a very, you've probably not heard anyone maybe speak like that before, but that's the way I, I experienced the moral argument I felt because I think independent, and I know in your book, Justin, you say it's a different, it's a not, it, you were trying to distinguish between let's talk about the moral argument and not the Bible. Mm-hmm. And I can see why you say that because you, it, it, it um, I do think that the moral argument is a great argument actually. And it, it on my weaker days, it leads me to some sort of mystery out there, maybe deism if I'm not quite woken up properly, you know, <laughs> but certainly nothing to do with Yahweh, you know, because it's the moral argument and intuitions for me that completely and utterly fall apart. Once you see, I know what you're doing there because a Muslim would make the argument you make. And then they, of course they join the dots to Allah. Mm-hmm. And when you're doing it, you, you're not sitting there thinking of some sort of mystery deity that has laid the ground of all being and morals and not thinking of God who is Yahweh. Mm. And, um, so you are thinking of God as Yahweh. So I immediately think, hang around, you know, I, I cannot help, but think, you know, um, the, the, the very moral so I, I i see it as something like it's so intrinsically linked once you assign yourself to christianity you then step into a new basin and you're away from some deity who could be like really good and then you're into um um like uh, some ob- obvious examples and and when i i've heard you on the show and people have said you know torturing babies i would just think well why don't you, you have that argument fair enough why don't you just substitute an Israelite putting a sword through a baby in Canaan and the value of that child. And then, and then make the argument for the moral argument. And you'd probably think, no, I'd rather use torturing babies today than (laughs) than that, because you think, okay, you can go to passages and Yahweh says, you know, go into the land to kill everything that doesn't breathe. And, and the value of life, um, as um, we've talked about Tom Stark's book on this podcast a few times, and his quote was the only good Canaanite was a dead one. The value of life in some parts of the old Testament uh, is so valueless that the intrinsic, you know, value that you can often associate with the arguments that say you make when you, when you do make that argument seem to me, they don't, you've got to embrace this as well. And I know you would do it as a separate subject, but to me, it comes up instantly do you see, so you see the point I'm making once, yeah, once yeah, you link yeah. it to Yahweh, you say, well, I just yeah. knew instinctively when I read the Bible, honestly, and I saw those passages, something in, in me said, that is not right. That's just mm. as not right mm. as ISIS doing it today. And I'm but, thinking, but the thing is, what is Andrew, that? I, 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 I mean, you know, I'm sure we'll come on to talk about <clears throat> the way we understand the old Testament and everything else, but yeah, yeah. in a sense, you're, you're the, the very instinctive reaction you have that that is not right. Yes in a sense i think is the point it's like it's you you recognize that this stuff strikes me as wrong and sh- you know that's not a good representation of god or of love or justice or value or whatever um and for me that that in a sense is 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 only serving to to sort of reinforce the point that we have this very strong sense that there, there are really are things right and wrong and and oh. you know and the ex the expectations and and he, I would even go as far as to say rather cheekily yeah. that um, 
your very indignant, you know, horror at those passages and, and so on is actually because you have been raised in a Judeo-Christian worldview. You know, it, it, in a sense, we judge the Bible on the basis of the Christian morality that we've all received uh, over, you know, several, a couple of millennia. Um, that's the whole irony of, of the way we react. People react with horror to the Bible today is they're reacting with horror to it because they're, they're, they're culturally conditioned to view people as having intrinsic value and, and dignity, which itself comes from the Bible. Um, so this is the kind of the, the great sort of irony of the whole thing. Well, and, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, because the problem is that you go to certain parts of China or other parts of the world or other ages they won't have a problem with what's in the Bible because um, they live in a kind of world that's, you know, where, yeah, that, that stuff happens, you know, it's, it's really because of where we've got to in our culture, which is so in my view, completely linked to our Judeo Christian history that we then turn around and criticize the Bible. Now, is that criticism valid is the next question. And not my view would well, be that. Well, we've had a Muslim on, on here, who, that, and I've spoken to Muslims at Speaker's Corner who are appalled at the, from an Islamic Allah point of view. I, I, don't, I don't know how they justify that with their own Quran, but, uh, but, but they are appalled at the Old Testament from a non-Christian point of view, non-Judeo-Christian influence. It, it comes from the morality of Allah. And so my point was, and I can see your point, that my gut reaction against that means that there might be some kind of maybe not personal God, or there might be some kind of objective thing that we don't haven't discovered yet that's out there that somehow is affecting us all with this aghast reaction. And it means that the God of the Bible is one of the reasons why he isn't real, because he doesn't match up to this this thing that we're all tapping into. So it's something bigger and higher or deeper or mysterious. But once you characterize the narratives of the character of God in the Bible, it doesn't fit it, because that's why you get all these apologists trying to bend over backwards, trying to make it, oh, yeah, well, you know, you can kill all these children then, but you can't now. And they, they, they're going to heaven anyway. So it's, a, you know, all of these things that don't kind of wash. Yeah. When, even I mean, Christians, to be honest, I, I mean, you know, you're not I, I struggle with the Old Testament, too. And I've said this. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah I've no, said that. This is, this is no secret. Um, I, you know, there are bits of the Old Testament that I really wish didn't come out the way they do because it's really hard to 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 understand why god is shown to be acting in this way or that way or the other way as i say the reason you know again the irony is the reason we're all judging it in that way is because actually i think it is intrinsically tied to to our judeo-christian history where we have come up with this idea of the intrinsic value of human beings and for me that that is there on page one if you like of genesis you know in his image, he created the male and female. That is almost unique, I would say, to Christianity among all the religions in the world and in that place and time, especially. And, and, and is so kind of has so informed the way we then understand the whole idea of human rights in the West ever since. I just think there's a very, very strong argument for that, but it still leaves us with this. this yeah, I'd, say, I'd say it was Jesus much more. Well, well the right. Tom Holland stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but it, Jesus is fulfilling, in a sense, what what began begins on page one of the Bible. There, but the but that's but this. But funnily enough, I'm glad you raised him Ed, um, <laughs> Jesus, from the dead. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is also where I go with with your problem there, Andrew. This won't be new to you, but um, you know, at the end of the day, I there are lots of ways you can apologetically sort of strategies if you like that you can approach with the old testament you know we've all read i'm sure you know the the, the paul copans and the greg boyds and the you know yeah, yeah um but but in the end for me um i i kind of have to I, I i kind of just go with okay i don't fully understand what's going on in some of those passages in the old testament but i do understand what i see in the person of jesus christ and what i am told and what i believe is that he is the best representation of god so if we're seeing god in some way in a slightly disfigured misunderstood or misinterpreted way in those old testament passages and i'm not making that judgment i'm, I'm not in a position to in in all honesty but if all i know is that you know like it says in hebrews whatever you heard in the past this is the real deal you know everything else was kind of just a picture a part of the puzzle 
this this person jesus now is the true representation of god um and for me i i'm happy with that i i you know that's why i am a christian you know i'm i'm not here in a sense to you know if you ask me what do you believe in i'm not going to take you to a passage in leviticus about slavery and say yes this is the core of my faith um no it's this person jesus and what he did and the the and the, the movement he began which was i think undeniably the most liberating empowering extraordinary transformative movement the world ever saw and has it and continues to see um we can wrangle about the bible uh, and about the character of yahweh but i personally i just see all of that kind of i just t- look through the lens of jesus christ and say i don't understand it all but i do understand jesus that's that's kind of where i where i end up with that there are realities though even with bible and christian scholars and everything who who see all these problems in the bible that that as christians they struggle with which is hierarchy and male headship and and you know like the yeah. different values of 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 people are given in passages in the bible as humans and there is the struggle of church history that has also had the bad side you know um with passages from the bible say in the new testament to do with slavery which were mm. used and picked up in yeah in, in in recent slavery and so the bible itself and christendom has also been quite abusive as yeah. another side of the coin um with warfare just you know with, with, with warfare principles that that perhaps a lot wouldn't hold today have often been enforced by the bible and so it, the bible itself doesn't seem to necessarily do the trick of this transformation because it's got this dark side throughout church history yeah. which has been pretty bloody in the name of christ even if you say well they got it all wrong the fact is it's still linked with christendom yeah, so yeah um, oh, and i'm not trying to absolve yeah, i'm not trying to yeah. suggest that you know <laughs> ever since the year zero you yeah know, but since it's jesus been, came it's been like this wonderful redemption mm. yeah yeah no um, i mean of course not um and you you referenced that you know um Tom Holland's book Dominion which you know makes this very powerful case I think yeah. the way our values are shaped by the Christian story and the Christian revolution but but does not hold back on all of the awful things that happened in the name of Christendom as well which, over yes. the centuries so yeah. so we you know there's there are no sort of rose tinted spectacles on that front and yes scripture gets used and abused of course it does um it's you know I mean goodness it was happening even when they would, you know, in those actual letters that Paul writes that form our New Testament, he's dealing with people who are using and abusing each other. And, you know, you know, it's, yeah, you know, <laughs> faith goes, you know, Christian faith is so easy for it to go wrong. And of course, you know, I hear a hundred stories a, a, a week, it seems like of, you know, the, the, the bad things that have happened. It's mainly because I'm subscribed to the friendly atheist on Patheos. And so oh, right, right. constantly, right. constantly yeah. puts out <laughs> stories about uh, awful things that Christians do somewhere in the world. Well, I, but I suppose, the, yeah, but yeah. it's, it, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I am under absolutely no illusions that people use the Bible in all kind of manner of horrific ways. Does that mean that there isn't a, an actual truth or reality at the center of it? I think there is. I don't think it's just, you know, I don't think it's just an accident that the person Jesus Christ and the movement he began happens to have been the most revolutionary transformative movement in the world. And, you know, obviously at, at the subjective level, I believe it's changed me and transformed me. So so it's not just a sort of purely historical intellectual reason why I believe in the truth of this. It's because of a personal. Now, obviously, that we've all got our own subjective experience and yeah. yours and Ed's is different to mine. Yeah, so yeah. I'm yeah. going to try and... Yeah. You know, I can't, I'm not going to say that that's going to convince you guys. Of course not. But I guess the point just is, you know, we, we could go down to the issues of slavery in the New yeah. Testament and everything. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I fully, you know, of course people have used it to justify, you know, chattel slavery, the transatlantic slave trade and all the rest of it. As I see it though, for something like that, for instance, um, you've equally got the evangelicals and the Quakers who were, you know, at the forefront of using the Bible, you know, and their belief in Jesus to emancipate slaves and to bring an end to the slave trade. Um, And you, and in the text itself, and again, fully admit, we all tend to read it with our own sort of perspective, don't we? But as you know, only a fairly cursory amount of grappling and understanding the context of the text where you've got things like the household codes in Paul helps you to see that 
there were reasons why Paul may have thought in this moment and this time and place, I'm not going to completely do away with the master slave dynamic that exists everywhere around us in the world today. But I'm also going to write some incredibly incendiary and unlikely things like the fact that in Christ, there is neither slave nor free. And I am going to send um, Onesimus back to Philemon or the other way around um, to uh, as a brother in Christ rather than as his slave. Um, you know, there are there are things that for me say this. There was a it, a new trajectory began within that was nestled as all things always are within the state of the world as it was then. So, um, yeah. yeah, anyway, um, I was going to ask, um, Andrew, could, this is from what I think we were talking about last episode. The bits that Justin were quoting from Paul, are like Anisimus and uh, Neither Slave Nor Free from Galatians, those are all genuine Paul. And the bits with the yeah. um, the laws for how to keep slaves yeah, and it gets obey it. your masters is, is dodgy Paul. Yes, yeah, pseudo Paul. If I, you're sat- I love the I love the technical terminology. <laughs> Dodgy Paul. Yeah, if you're saturated in biblical criticism as as I tend to be, um, nerdy like, um, there is a trajectory um, that that explains. It's not necessarily nice for sort of more fundamentalist conservatives to hear because it then taps into other theological issues. But if you see the trajectory that say um, the, um, to to P- Peter where it mentions slavery and 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 um, later paul um say colossians or what or ephesians particularly these aren't paul and they're people writing in his name um for various reasons that can be looked at we did this in the last podcast was the very subject of forgeries in the new testament um there's a lot that seems to make sense if you take some of that scholarship on board and you think oh yeah that makes sense then so 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 in um timothy where it says you know i, I permit not a woman to teach her of authority it wasn't paul it was a more patriarchal time as we moved on that was seeking to bring in more of a roman head of house culture into the church and seek it to be more in line with rome than actually what paul may have actually he probably would have turned in his grave at what people would to, to changing his words to be now i tend to see that from the outside now it's quite reasonable um looking at the text now aside from challenging inspiration and things like that it there's a lot that 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 makes sense but i don't know whether you normally incorporate that kind of understanding into the way you would talk about things like that though justin yeah i i don't i I mean yeah i follow with interest the 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 literature um and you know hosted my own debates with people like bart ehrman on on that whole issue of um the the, you know the authorship of paul and everything else um but yeah, I, I mean, I, I suppose at a simple level, I believe we have the Bible God wanted us to have. And whether that's Paul writing or people right. writing in the tradition of Paul or whatever, I, I kind of I take it as a whole. I don't I don't sort of think, well, I'm going to believe this bit more because it's probably is Paul and this bit less because it's probably not Paul. Um, I But then my approach to the Bible isn't a sort of I think the problem is that you do have a strand of Christianity, which is very sort of wooden in terms of the way it handles the bible anyway so Mm, you've got a kind of a a sort of flat sort of reading and understanding of the bible as though you can just sort of open the page take a sentence and sort of apply that somehow you know literally um in in you know the the bible i for me is um I, i i read it more as a narrative and as a way of understanding the story of jesus that makes sense of my story and um, I'm not going to get too het up over what Paul told Christians in a particular time and place about the nature of slave master relations or whatever, and whether it was Paul or not specifically making that. It's it's sort of I don't I I don't know I just I just can't get too bothered or wound up about that myself. I know some some Christians. Would, do, would, would you say but, the same then to um, say homosexuality then with the same principles of Paul? Well, the, by the same standard, I would say you take it you have to take things as a whole. You have to kind of understand things. And it's, you know, I, I object to, the, you know, when people just take one passage about it, even if it is about another subject, yeah, yeah. Out, out of context yeah, and, yeah. and sort of say, this is therefore what the Bible says. I want to say, no, I want to, I want to note that the Bible says that there. And I want to note that the Bible says this here. And I'm going to yeah. take the, the, the collective and I'm going to ask, how am I going to, with the Holy Spirit's help, interpret and understand this, because that's what I believe we're called to do as Christians. And I'm going to 
take, you know, I, I'm going to believe that God is also speaking to me through the witness of other Christians and what they've said and thought and taught about it. And, and I'm ultimately going to have to come to a point where I say, this is, this is where my best understanding and reading and faith leads me to do that. And, you know, and, and so it's, it's kind of, um, but that would never kind of, you could never boil that down to just, well, it says here in first Timothy or something, that's it. It's going to be something holistic. If, if, you know, marriage is something that should only be between a man and a woman, it's not going to be because one specific verse in the Bible told me that it's going to be something about the whole story that tells me that if you know what I mean. So, so, so yeah. Um, but do, do you find go... it hard then when other people do that exact process as you with the Holy Spirit and with, with devotion, with community, you know, groups that come in and they all see the same thing, but they actually see it all differently. Yeah, I as do. I do. So many yeah, subjects. As, and, and, I know and as, as you debated with Nabil Qureshi, you know, yeah. the, the, there is this problem of yeah. the diversity of Christian belief. And if we are all meant to be as one, you know, yeah. Put, I, I think I said on that show, will the real Jesus yeah. please stand up, you know, yeah, quite, um, quite. and actually say, no, no, it's over here. <laughs> yeah. um, no, it's, it's a huge issue. And um, I, I, I'm not going to duck the, the significance of it, Andrew, because mm. I think um, it's a very vexing one to put it mildly, you know, that we live in a world in which um, we can say we're worshiping the same God through Jesus Christ, but having come away with completely some very, very different ideas very about what that, ideas, what that yeah. means. Justin, um, sorry, yes. for, sorry. I just wanted to Go ask on. in, in your book, you refer to, there are some things that are shades of gray arguments. Mm. Mm. And if, if you're thinking in terms of um, morality as objective, does that lead you to believe that, every moral question has a right or wrong answer. There is just one right answer if we knew it. Or, um, or do, is there, are there just some intractable moral problems where there's yeah, always no, I, room I, 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 disagreement? I think, yeah. Well, I guess just returning to, you know, that subject of, of objective versus subjective morality. Yeah. I'm, I, I think I would be happy to say there are lots of areas where, what the best course of action is is up for grabs you know where there are ethical sort of conundrums and gray areas um so and and you will weigh the you know the best path differently depending on your prior commitments very often you know Mm. uh, the person who is you know um values human sort of individual freedoms and rights you know will come to a different conclusion on taxation and that sort of thing from the person who believes in sort of, a sort of socialist sort of form. And, but that doesn't stop there being a, a rightness and wrongness about morality, because in a sense, the thing that they're both angling for ultimately in that ethical conversation is what's the best way to run a society or what's, what gives human beings their best, you know, their most, dignity and value it's it's there's still an objective thing that's at stake even if it feels like once you get into the weeds of the specifics of of many ethical ethical issues you you know it's very hard to say that one person is right and one person is wrong does that make sense but well it it certainly makes sense to me but i'm not sure how it fits in with your belief that there is or this seems to be your belief that there is a right or wrong answer. I mean, would you say, I mean, I've asked Christians this a few times and mm. I've never got, uh, I've never got an answer really. Mm. Um, and I don't know whether it's because they think I'm being mocking or because they think it's a gotcha question, but it isn't, it's, it's a genuine question mm. that mm. I would say, well, you know, if you take something that you might believe in profoundly, like the death penalty, whichever mm. side of that argument you're mm. on mm. and you get to heaven and let's say you were against the death penalty and God says, you know, death penalty is fine. I, I mean, is there anything where you would sort of come back to God and say, um, but what about this God? You know, what, what about mm. these arguments or do your arguments just all, well, obviously, you know, when I would, you find I, I'm expecting when I get smoke, when I get to heaven, I'm assuming God is going to agree with me on absolutely everything. <laughs> I believe, Francis, cause, cause why wouldn't he? I mean, right. no, I mean, you you put your day, you, you put your finger on it there. It's, 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 a, I am 
very fallible as a human being. And I hope we'd all have the humility to admit that we might be wrong <laughs> about a great number of things, including ethical issues. Um, and yeah, as it happens, I don't agree with the death penalty. So there's a good example. And what if I pitched up in heaven and God said, ah, oh, it turns out, you know, there, there was a really good ethical reason why we, you know, <laughs> the process of traveling around Texas. But, but, say. <laughs> um, I, I it, suppose that, that's sorry, quite my on, point that you, would, yeah. that you would expect him to give you a reason, I, I gather from that, that it wouldn't be enough for him just to say, this is what I say, this is my nature. Death, but my nature is that the death yes, penalty. Yes, is good. I would. I would be surprised if if that was if the death penalty um, was a, 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 a valid expression of God's nature in terms of what I understand, you know, God, the way God values life and so on. Now, I've no doubt though that if I am mistaken in that, it will become it, it, with God there. It'll become right. glaringly apparent to me just why that I was mistaken about that. Um, now, as it happens, I don't think I will be, but that's just my hubris, you know, that, that I believe that that's sort of one of those You'll ones. You'll probably say, oh, oh, Paul didn't write that. I was trying to stop this writer <laughs> saying this. <laughs> Jolly thing got into the canon and they but, didn't spot it. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, what you're asking, though, Francis, is there, you know, is there a definite right or wrong on every moral issue mm. you could get to mention? In a sense, I think we we almost it's it's impossible for us as humans to ever be able to be have that level of certainty about a, a wide wide number of things mm. because we don't have enough knowledge we don't have enough perspective on the picture i think it's perfectly possible that god could have perfect moral knowledge of every single situation if you like because he sees every contributing factor that we simply can't see so so in a sense i don't have any problem with the idea that god knows exactly what the right moral thing is answer is to every single moral question where where there is a a right or wrongness about it Mm. um i think though that god is gracious enough to to kind of engage with the fact that we're human and that we as long as our spirit is if you like attuned to trying to work out the right thing and often failing i'm sure but that, that god's grace will you know you know well you know we mm. as a christian i believe we're all sinners and we get things wrong all the time and i do too uh but but that that god god um god's not gonna you know beat me up about that when i get to heaven let's say so so yeah it's um it, it, it's it's a factor of our you know our human humanity makes it impossible for us to to know in a great deal of cases what is right and what is wrong i'd say have you well thank you for letting me ask my question i just want to say thank you for letting me ask my question thank you for answering it (laughs) okay i was going to say have you moved on anything that you could talk about like um i'm i'm going to suspect you might have moved your view of hell based on your character of god and the traditional view to something else because of once at once you would have embraced it because what you thought it was right and then you didn't yeah i mean and you know i'll be honest i mean not that I spend a great deal of time thinking about the nature of hell before I started doing unbelievable. Um, so sometimes just doing apologetics theology forces you to, to kind of take a position on something. Yes. Um, but, uh, you know, I grew up in a church where yes, there was a kind of traditional view of, of hell, eternal conscious torment though. I don't think they, they would even have called it that exactly, but that was the idea. And, um, and I, through a combination, yes, of both feeling that actually ultimately once I went and studied the the, the text for myself, that that mm. didn't line up with with what the Bible actually says about hell. And yes, certainly a moral dimension to it where I, I couldn't square it with the character of, of a just and loving God, um, that it made sense for me to change my view on that. But that's one of those ones where I, I wouldn't have described myself as the previous view I had as sort of some kind of thought out, you know, conviction exactly it was more a handed down to me um kind of a right a, without, thing. without thinking um, it was very common yeah yeah um so yeah that's but that's a good example yeah. where, where i'd certainly say if my, my view has changed to um yeah to what yeah. what i would call now yeah it's often called annihilationism yeah, but yeah. I, yeah I was, even now i'm now, I'm, now I'm, I've, I'm so influenced these days by tom wright and and he's very he's kind of got a slightly hard to pin down view of oh hell. you can't pin anything <laughs> right down on that feel. one it's so sort <laughs> of like nuanced that you don't know what he's talking about it's, i sometimes i don't think um, I, I mean the, but that applies to so many areas of doctrine generally i think 
the problem the, the danger always especially in apologetics is we love having everything neatly categorized yeah. and boxed into a particular sort of you know really sort of logically you know this makes sense in this this kind of box this framework of understanding it and and there are so many areas where you know having heard the debates on those you know from people who passionately believe it one way and the other way mm. i i kind of end up feeling like well i i'm more inclined in this direction but i mean I, it, we're talking about stuff that we've probably got like an iota of a kind of god's perspective on in the end if we're talking about you know the whole you know uh, predestination or calvinist versus you know mm. free will stuff oh, I, I always feel like it gets a little bit like We'll, when we stand before God, we'll find we were just like dabbling in the shallows with these, you know, philosophical debates. I just feel like sometimes I just feel like, you know, we never, we're not going to understand it from our perspective. Yeah. Um, and let's give it a good shot. But, um, you know, it's so much of that stuff, I think, is yeah. kind of... I tend to joke that when we all stand before Allah, <laughs> 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 then we'll all know what's going on. I think, um, okay. said that to Hassan when he was on here on, on the show. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, we, need to, we need to let Justin yeah. go, I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's gone too fast. Yeah, yeah, we could have spent twice the time. Oh, we spent <laughs> probably every month. <laughs> <laughs> I have got your next book title, though, Justin. It would be Justin oh, yeah. Riley's Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so that's, a, that's, 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 that's that'll a, bring an altogether different audience that would bring it would wouldn't yeah. it but seeing yeah. as it's uh, you have shades of gray i think that was a reference that um francis made yeah um, <laughs> oh right blame <laughs> me from, 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 <laughs> no from morality i mean yeah 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 well you know that's it yeah. I'll, I'll be up there in the best sellers if i yes, try to. that's right <laughs> <laughs> then you can explain uh, yourself in the actual book yeah. <laughs> um but yeah it's been fantastic having you on great Justin, and, uh, thanks for having me treated on. you well so can i can I just also give a shout out? Um, I don't know when this podcast will go out, but I'd love to um, anyone who's interested in you, you may well have heard of the unbelievable show, of course, if, if you're listening, but um, we have a, a big conversation series currently airing from unbelievable. Uh, and uh, if anyone would like to go and check out that we've got a, a re- some really interesting conversations coming up One we've just done uh, over Easter between Bishop um, Robert Barron and Alex O'Connor. Um, and I love got, that. Uh, and, Yes. probably by the time this, i'm not sure when this this goes out guys but but uh, we've fourth, got uh, the fourth of each month roughly uh, fine well, so, so in that case yeah. so in that case st- still time to book in if you're listening <laughs> yes to um uh watch um nt wright and douglas murray have a have a conversation which we just confirmed just last week um uh that's on thursday the 13th of may we're doing a live stream conversation as part of the big the big conversation so um I'll, uh, you can you can put links in the info and that kind of yeah, thing yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. To you. Yeah. and um and uh and of course the unbelievable conference is there as well if you want to be part of that on saturday the 15th of may unbelievable.live sorry for the adverts but no that's great maybe you can point um on your next show um that you've advertised that here <laughs> i will i will i'll say <laughs> that's a nuanced way isn't it if you want to hear about my conference or this conference go to the doubts aloud podcast absolutely it's yeah. the only place to find out about unbelievable that's right that's right <laughs> uh, well, big I, feel, you know, I, yeah. I started by introducing the show as unbelievable so and i've ended the way i normally do with unbelievable by with a load of adverts telling you yes that's great exactly things. well if if it all falls apart for your next show just put this up it's been quite fun yeah um, well thank you so good. much for having me it's really yeah. been a lot of fun actually it mm. has I, I hope i look forward to the day when we can meet in person again hopefully yes yes, yes. yeah a pub somewhere in london and, and do this properly yeah. yes yeah. yes absolutely. absolutely yeah absolutely yeah it's been great thank you for your time justin so much Mm, thank you thank you